Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org. Uh, we're very pleased to have all of you here today. Uh, we're also very pleased to have our presenter here today, uh, Wendy Morrison from NOAA. She's with the National Marine Fisheries Service Office of Sustainable Fisheries. And she's going to be speaking about assessing the vulnerability of marine fish and invertebrate stocks to climate change. Um, before we turn this over to Wendy to get started with the presentation, I wanted to let you know that we'll have the presentation for 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll have the remaining time for a question and answer. Um, there's two ways to ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand and I can unmute you and you can ask the question directly to Wendy. Uh, this option only works if you have a working microphone or if you enter the PIN number if you're on the phone. The other way to ask questions is to type the questions into the question panel of the user interface and then I will take those questions and relay them to Wendy. Um, you can type, you can send in questions whenever you want, uh, even during the presentation. Uh, we'll hold all the um, content questions till the end. If there's any quick clarification questions like what an acronym stands for, um, I, I might be able to ask Wendy during the presentation. Okay, Wendy, I'll turn it over to you now. All right, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I hear you just fine. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure one more time. Um, all right, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about this um, cool project we've been working on for quite a few years. Um, just setting up a vulnerability methodology to uh, figure out the vulnerability of marine fish and invertebrate species to climate change. And I'll dive right in. And it's not moving. Hold on, let me see what I'm doing. Oh, this happens actually once, you, once you've once you had it up. Um, just exit presentation mode and then go back into presentation mode. This is okay. a common occurrence. Oh, good. It, it freezes for some reason. We're not quite sure why. But there it is. Then, okay. Let's try and then go back into presentation mode and should okay. work. Ah, there we go. Yep. All right. So here's an outline I, just so we can keep track of where I am in the presentation and where we're going today. Um, I'm going to cover seven basic areas, um, a little bit on the background and need, the goals and objectives of the, the project, um, vulnerability assessment frameworks as a whole, where we see the usefulness of, of this type of analysis, and then quite a bit on the methodology itself, so the longest time will be spent on that part, um, a little bit on output and results of the first run of the methodology, and then an update on where we are in terms of what assessments are going now and where we're going into the future. So background and need, um, I know it's a little bit of a, the speaking to the choir right here, preaching to the choir, that marine resources are important for many reasons. And there's a couple of them listed here. There's a lot more that aren't listed, but they are important and we need to manage them wisely and figure out um, what are the effects of climate change on these resources. In terms of fisheries, the types of changes we expect, we expect them to be in four large categories that are listed here. We expect to see changes in productivity, and this would be of the ecosystem itself. So changes to the food web, maybe um, some of the plankton species that will um, affect as they go on up. We um, expect and are seeing shifts in distributions of the species. There's a lot of examples of this. The um, one on the slide is for cod. We also expect and have been seeing changes in abundances of individual species. And then the changes in interactions. So for example, as black sea bass changes its um, distribution further north, what does that predator have? How does that predator affect other species lower on the food chain? Or the interaction with protected species change as um, the climate changes. So I do want to mention that National Marine Fisheries Service has been thinking about climate change for a while and what are the needs in terms of um, the science and management of these species. And so at the end, I'll give a link for this. But back in August of 2015, NIMPS released the NOAA Fisheries Climate Science Strategy, which outlines um, the first run at our, our strategy of determining what we need for the science and how we're going to get there. Right now, each of the regions is coming up with a regional action plan. And so if you're interested in this, um, go to your region and look for the regional action plan. And um, it will be open for public comment where you can provide feedback. Um, within the fisheries climate science strategy, the need for vulnerability assessments is mentioned um, quite a few places. And it's in the priority actions um, is to run vulnerability analyses for the, the fish and invertebrate species 
um, in all the regions within the next couple of years. Okay, so that's the background and need. Um, a little bit into the goals and objectives of um, setting up the vulnerability assessment. So the overall goal is we wanted to um, just produce a methodology for looking across multiple species. So for example, when we did our first run in the Northeast, it was 82 species. We um, analyzed the vulnerability of all those species at once. So it's just a tool to look across multiple species, basically a triage, a first look to figure out which species would be more vulnerable or less vulnerable between those species as, as a first step. And then if you look at the specific objectives, as I said, develop a relative vulnerability between species, figure out what are the life history traits or the attributes behind that vulnerability, um, and then also identify where there's um, data gaps. And so as I said, this, is, this methodology is a triage that does more of a qualitative analysis across multiple species, but why not the quantitative approach? Um, in the Northeast, John Hare basically has been involved in a lot of these, but there's been five species that have had a good quantitative mechanistic analysis done. It ends up taking multiple people, multiple years per species, and he did the math, and that, so to understand climate change impacts on 50 species, it would be over 100 years. That's not really feasible. We need this fast triage method to get through and just, as I said, get a first cut. Okay, a little bit on the vulnerability assessment framework. Um, vulnerability assessments, I guess I'll, I'll walk through the box on the right first. Can I point with an arrow? Yeah. Um, so the f overall framework for a vulnerability assessment, you have the exposure, so how much the species is exposed to climate change, combined with the species sensitivity to that change, results in the vulnerability. And I do have an asterisk here. In our analyses, we included adaptive capacity within the sensitivity. Um, other methodologies will have adaptive capacity as a separate box that combines to create the vulnerability. Um, and I can explain later if folks want why we de decided to do that. But the um, vulnerability assessments as a whole are used widely in terrestrial systems, so this is not something we invented for the marine. We um, looked to NatureServe was one of the leaders in this. Um, so we, we looked at what they've done and modified it. There were a few examples from the marine environment, mostly from Australia, that we also looked at. The assessment uses um, existing knowledge and expert opinion, so it doesn't do any new analyses. And then if there's quantitative data available, of course we're going to use it. If not, then qualitative is just fine. So that's where the expert opinion comes in. So I wanted to clarify what we meant by vulnerability when we developed this methodology. In our mind, vulnerability was the risk of a species having a change in its abundance or a species productivity. So we wanted to identify those species that we expected to decrease in abundance um, as the climate changes, so pulling out those. As we were moving forward with this, we talked to some managers and they were also interested in the species that would shift distributions. So they wanted to know which would um, decrease in abundance and be impacted that way, but also which ones would shift in distribution. The original way we looked at it was as if a species is able to adapt by changing its distribution, that gave it a lower vulnerability because it can, it can adapt, it can um, change to deal with it. Um, so we then realized we could pull out a subset of our attributes, which I'll get to later, that can predict the species that have the propensity to shift distributions so that we can give the managers an estimate of the vulnerability to shifts in abundance as well as which ones have the ability to shift in distribution in the future. Um, potential uses. So we have potential uses for both the science side and the management side. The more obvious ones are for the science side. So the stock assessment scientists are very interested in the results of these assessments. They can help them identify species that would benefit by putting, going that extra mile and incorporating some environmental parameter into the stock assessment. So um, it can help them identify where they want to do that. It also can, as I mentioned earlier, identify gaps in the data, so where we may want to put our research attention and dollars and then also could determine where maybe just increased monitoring will be important 
for example, if there's a shellfish species that we expect the larval um, abundance to be impacted by ocean acidification, I, um, monitoring those larvae and determining when that occurs would be very important. On the management side, um, the results can be used to base, give a first cut on which stocks we want to keep an eye on and we may want to adjust the management target, so how much fishing can be done on those species, and also rebuilding plants. So which species may not be able to rebuild to their former abundance if climate is affecting their recruitment or their survival. Um, the information has already been used in some of the information documents, such as EISs and biological opinions for um, protected species. And then it also can, if you look at the life history traits that led to the vulnerability, it can start to identify possible um, management actions. So for example, if a species is vulnerable because it has a limited spawning cycle, then we might want to increase the protection on those spawning aggregations, things like that. You can, can take that to the next step. All right, so here is going to be the meat of the um, presentation, going to try to walk you through the methodology itself. So as I said, the vulnerability is dependent on a combination of the exposure and the sensitivity. So um, you can see here the sensitivity, there are 12 different life history characteristics that um, define the sensitivity, and the exposure here we have um, six, I think, listed out, six or seven. So what we expect is as this methodology gets implemented around the United States or even around the world if folks are interested, is we hope that those sensitivity attributes stay the same. So all of the analyses will have those same sensitivity attributes, but obviously what's important in terms of exposure will change depending on the different regions. The Caribbean won't be so concerned about coverage of sea ice is a good example, whereas the North Pacific would be. A little more detail on the exposure. It's defined as um, how much climate-related change a species is going to experience. It's the, so for climate change, obviously there's vari variability that you're going to see year-to-year -year variability, decadal variability, as well as the signal of climate change. And that's what the figure is showing. Is This is for the temperature in the northeast. And you can see a large variability through time. But, and, that's, and then the squiggly line is the, I think it's a three-year mean, I'm not really sure, um, where the line shows them the, the impacts of climate change. And so for this methodology, we're not singling out the impacts of climate change. We're just looking at the, the impacts of climate as a whole. So it will include that variability as well as the overall climate um, signal that's on the way up. And then we, for it to get at exposure, we looked at where the species was currently distributed, distribution was, and then how much we expect the climate to change in that area. We didn't try to predict future distributions in, in this methodology. Oh, and then the last point is that we wanted to look at the expected change relative to the current variability. So if you have an area that has high variability in temperature throughout the year, those species are going to be able to handle changes better than um, something in the tropics that has very stable environment. So we looked at change in terms of the standard deviation, so how much of the uh, future change as a standard deviation of what they currently experience. Here's um, the map. So one of the cool things of this project is we um, created a partnership with a different line office in, in NOAA, the OAR branch, Ocean and Atmospheric Research Branch. And they went ahead and created this portal. The web address is down on the bottom right. Um, so feel free to get on there and play around. But it's a global model. So it is not a downscaled model. It is a global model. Um, for the marine environment. So it has surface change, it has depth, it has salinity, it has temperature. Um, go play with it. It's relatively coarse. It has a one degree um, long, um, area, latitude, longitude, so it's not going to get some of that fine scale information. We looked at the change um, 1956 to 2005 and then 2006 to 2055. And so the map I show on the right, I accidentally did the further out. I did 2050 to 2099, but it shows the expected change in temperature for, for the northeast and the Atlantic. 
Um, I do want to note there is a finer scale model out there, Saba et al. 2016, just put it out, um, and it also predicts large warming for the, the northeast U.S. Okay, on to the other half, sensitivity. So the way we did sensitivity is it's the biological, like history characteristics that can be used to predict which stocks may be more vulnerable to a changing climate. So there, we had a long discussion of whether we wanted to use current life history characteristics or future. So did we want the experts to rank expected changes in reproductive capacity for each species or rank species based on their current reproductive um, life history traits. For example, how complex is a reproductive? Those that have more complex reproductive strategies you expect could be impacted by climate change more if one aspect of their reproduction is impacted. Um, and they, um, the experts that we had talked to, our working group, decided to stick with the current. So there would be less of the um, I guess, ambiguity in what, what they were thinking. So they could be pretty pretty secure in how they were the ranking these things. Um, so I wanted to also, I guess I put a slide in for this. Yes, so for each of the 12 sensitivity attributes, we went and created a document that walks through specifics for what we meant for that. And so I just pulled out a very small subset of those to put on this slide, and I know it's a lot of words, so feel free to ignore it if you wish, and I will tell you what it says. But it's just an example that for each of those sensitivity attributes, we went through and explained what we meant, what was the relationship with climate change, and then also helped define what we meant by a low, a moderate, a high, or a very high ranking. That way, if you've got two experts in the room, for example, let's say you have a shellfish expert and an expert on highly migratory species, their understanding of what a highly mobile adult you know, would be very different. And so we kind of went ahead and defined those so that any expert that came in would have an idea of what we meant. Um, and that was to try to increase the, the precision. Um, one of the cool things about our methodology was this five-point tally scoring system. And yes, we did get it from other folks, but it's, it was a good find. We, this is a way that the experts, when they're ranking the species, so experts would go in and rank each species for each of those sensitivity attributes as whether they thought it was a low, a moderate, a high, or a very high. But this was a way that they should, could show their uncertainty. So if an expert was very, very sure, certain that, I don't know, the habitat specificity of a species was a moderate, they could put all of their five tallies in that moderate bin and show their certainty there. If they knew it was going to be impacted either high or very high, but they couldn't really specify um, exactly, they could split their tallies, like in the second example, where they split their tallies between high and very high and put three and two if it was something they really knew nothing about. So let's say it was a species where we're looking at the early life history requirements. So like the larval, the requirements of a larval fish species. Um, how specific are they? And it's a species we don't know much about their larvae at all. They can spread their tallies across all four bins to show that uncertainty. But notice that we gave them five tallies and four bins, and that was on purpose because we wanted to make them give us some expert opinion on which one they thought was most likely, given you know all the options. Um, so it was just a, a pretty cool way for experts to show their um, uncertainty in their scoring as they're, as they're doing it. The um, other thing we did is we had the experts give us a data quality score. That, so while they were showing this uncertainty with their tallies, they could also tell you what, you know, what kind of data they used to get at that score. Was it adequate data? Was it limited data? Was it purely expert judgment? And so you could also look at that to figure out where data gaps are or understand which of their um, rankings was, was based on purely expert opinion. The process we used to um, get the experts to score and um, provide these vulnerability ranks overall, we used a two-phase process. So first, the experts um, listened to a webinar where we explain the methodology explain the um, life history attributes, explain what we wanted them to do in terms of scoring, and then we had them go out and score it on their own. So they had, you know, were able to look at the definition of what we meant by complex reproductive strategy, 
what we meant by high, moderate, low, very low, and then go ahead and on their own give those scores. Um, we did provide them with a species profile that walked through basic information on each species so they didn't have to go and look each one up. We, we provided that into a packet for them, but they were you know, obviously the experts in the field so could take their expert opinion and add it in. We then took all those tallies and um, combined them together and pulled the experts together into a workshop where they could discuss the results. The idea was if they scored first on their own, it decreased um, the bias where they weren't, didn't, someone didn't tell them, well, this score should be low. They had to actually come up with on their own. But then we had pulled them together so they could discuss. And so if you look at this chart here with the different colors, what the different colors are showing you is each bunch of colors is a different expert. So in the upper left where it says adult mobility, this chunk of um, yellow is some an expert, Mr. Yellow's five tallies. He put all his five tallies in low. You can see expert green put all his five tallies in moderate where expert red must have done four and one. So you can see by the colors how the experts spread their tallies. And you can see in this example here, they were pretty much in agreement. The adult mobility for this species should be a low to a moderate. Um, if you look below it, again, the experts were pretty much in agreement, but in agreement that they knew nothing. So you can see that all of the experts spread their tallies across two or three bins, showing a real lack of knowledge on the early life history survival of this species. But what we wanted to use for the workshop was an example on this bottom right one here, based, this habitat specificity one. You can see that all of the experts basically agree that it's a low, maybe a chance of a moderate, except for Mr. Expert Green, who put everything in high and very high. So we would bring this up at the workshop and be like, all right, Mr. Green, Expert Green, what do you know that we don't? Maybe it's a species that Mr. Green works on and he just figured out and has a new paper that has, has, is coming out and no one else knows about. Or, as most of the cases, um, Mr. Green just messed up, accidentally put his bins not where he meant them to. Um, so after the workshop, the experts were given a chance to go back and change them if they wanted to. We did not force them to do anything. We didn't care if there was consensus. We just wanted to provide them a chance to discuss their scores, discuss these discrepancies, and then excuse me, adjust if they wanted to. Um, and then that would give us our final scores. The way to calculate the vulnerability um, for each, so each expert would go in and have their five tallies for each attribute. You would have four to five experts per species. We would do a weighted average of tallies across the experts. Low was worth one, moderate with two, um, high three, very high four, and you just get a numerical score for each attribute for each species. Um, then enable to look at, okay, how do you take those, you'll have 12 attribute scores for the life history attributes that go into sensitivity. How do you determine what the overall sensitivity for that species would be? And we spent a lot of time looking into this and trying to figure out what was the best method. Should we average them? Should we add them? What, what was the best, best math, mathematical, math, my words aren't coming out, mathematical option? What we finally decided to do was modify something from Chin et al. It was a paper out in 2010 from the Australians that used a logic model that basically just said, we are interested on those highs or very highs. So if you've got a species that has three attributes that scored more than 3.5, so with majority of the bins above in that very high bin, we want to know about it. So that's what we pulled out as our logic. Anything that had three or more of those 12 attributes in that very, mostly in that very high bin, then they would get a very high sensitivity score. To get a high, you needed two or more of your scores above a 3.0, and you can go on that. And low was then anybody who didn't meet the very high, high, or moderate. And this was our way of pulling out those that were, were really in trouble, that had, you know, we tried to make the highest bar for the very high, and then just figure out which ones had multiple things impacting them. Um, and it seems to have worked pretty well. We then, to combine sensitivity and exposure, we take, again, the low is one, medium is two, high three, very high four, and we multiply them. 
and what we end up getting is a um, a plot like this one where in, for the most part the overall vulnerability rank is going to be the lower of the two. So if you have a species that is expected to be have a low exposure to climate change but have a high sensitivity, they should be okay because they're not going to have much change at all that are, they're experiencing. The opposite, if they have a low sensitivity but they have a high exposure, they should also be okay. So as you can see, we took the lower of the two except on the case of very high and just to be precautionary, we popped it up one. So a low sensitivity and a very high exposure would get at a moderate rank. Um, all right, so that is the methodology in a nutshell. Let's see how I'm doing on time, 26, good. Um, just to talk a little bit about the output and results then. The types of information that are produced, there's five main um, parts of information produced. Um, first of all, most obviously, the overall vulnerability to changes in productivity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we also then provide a, an estimate of the ability of that species to change distribution. And then we added something called just an overall directional score. So do we expect, we would then, we went after the experts did all their ranking, we had them go back and say for this species, in the next 10 years in your region, do you expect it overall to do better, to do worse, or be neutral? Well, you don't really know and we just got this overall directional score. One of the key things out of the results are species vulnerability narratives, and if anybody is interested in the results, I, I recommend you go to there. Um, these are two to three pages per species where it walks through the results. Why does it have a um, sensitivity? What are the attributes that led to that sensitivity? What other research on climate and that species has been done? So it's a lot of good information. And then also, again, pointing out this climate change web portal that was that partnership we did with the other branch of NOAA as OAR, which is the picture on the bottom. Again, I've, I will highlight again what I think is really important are these vulnerability narratives. And this is an example of what you would see. So the first page of the vulnerability narrative would be this um, table to the left. Um, and what it would be, so this is an example for alewife, and so for all of the life history characteristics, you would get where the experts put their tallies. So this is the overall expert tallies. Green is, is tallies the experts put in the low, the moderate is yellow, orange high, and red very high. So you can see how the expert tallies fell out. It gives you that um, mean score, and it gives you the data quality. And then on the next couple pages, as I said, they walk you through what this means for that species. So if you are interested in species by species results, I highly recommend these. Um, as I'm sitting here, I realized that I didn't point out that when we um, basic when we defined the 12 sensitivity attributes, for the most part, it was a those that are generalists will be okay, whereas those that are specialists will not be okay. So specialists in their diet are the ones that are going to have a higher vulnerability, specialists in their habitat needs, specialists in their reproductive needs, and that's the basic ecology for how we ended up doing a lot of these 12 um, life history attributes. And for some reason, I just realized I never told you that. Um, here's a nice summary of the results. As I said, the first implementation of this is in the Northeast and it was on 82 species. So we pulled all the species managed by the Northeast um, New England Fishery Management Council, Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, by the states, as well as um, some of the forage species or other important species were all thrown in. Um, results, there's a website at the bottom, it's also at the end. And then this is just a general output of the results. The key thing to notice is that nothing was given a low or a moderate on the exposure. The expected climate change in the northeast U.S. on the, on the ocean side is large. There is more than a two standard deviation uh, projected increase in temperature, more than a two standard deviation expected increase in ocean acidification. So these species are going to deal with some big changes and, and pretty quick. So just the way it fell out, everything was high and very high in terms of exposure. 
we did get more of a spread on the biological sensitivity. And as you can see, for example, on the very high, the little picture of a lobster, I mean there's two inverts in that category. Um, the one, there's a diadromus, there's a lasma branch. There's, you know, the pictures depict. But you can see that overall your invertebrates, so your shellfish, are more, more vulnerable due to their vulnerability to ocean acidification. And the pelagic species are, on the, are usually on the less vulnerable side. So the next slide I'm going to throw up shows the results with all 82 species thrown into a box. And I know it's too much. I just felt that folks may want to see what the full results look like. So here's all the species. I'm not going to spend any time. I just wanted to provide this in case folks were interested. You do notice that the text is different for some of the species. If it's a black font with bold, this is we did a bootstrap where we took all of the expert scores and you know pulled with replacement and to see where they would end up, um, how often they ended up in that same ranking. And the, the colors show the results of that bootstrap analysis. So if it has black bold, 95% of those bootstraps, more than 95, they ended up in the same category. Black italic means less so 90 to 95% of the time, but still pretty sure that's where they're supposed to be. The italic white or gray, um, less than 66% of the time they ended up in that bin. So those are, are more variability. They're less certain about those results. Um, anyway, here's the full result. Again, I know it's too much. Um, so what I decided to do is then just show some results um, for subsets. So for this one, I pulled out the mid-Atlantic species. Um, so these are the species managed by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. And you can see that in terms of how their species fell out, they're not doing so bad. They've got a lot that are going to be, that are in this, this low vulnerability, and only the ocean quahog ended up in the very high. We also have this um, metric that we pulled together um, that tells the potential for the species to have a distribution shift. Um, this was based on four of the life history attributes. So if it's a highly mobile adult, if it has a long larval dispersal, if it has um, more generic habitat needs, and if it has um, specific temperature needs, we see them more likely to change their distribution. And what we found, and again, a subset of the species, I give these results, these are the species managed by the Atlantic States Marine um, Fisheries Commission. Um, but this is true for most of the species. We ended up with a large chunk of them in that high. So a, lar a lot of the species in the Northeast have the potential to, to shift their distribution as the climate changes, and, and we are seeing that in that area. And then I, the third thing we measured was this directional effect. So we went back to the experts and said, overall, which species you expect to do, you know, um, po respond positively in the near future, negatively or neutral. Um, and this is for the, the species managed by the New England Fishery Management Council. And you can see that um, there's a little worrisome. So there's a lot of species from that council that we expect to be negatively impacted, a couple of neutrals, and we didn't get any positives. Um, other councils were much more balanced. Um, but this is yeah, not good news for, for that area. Um, I wanted to highlight the um, one of the things you can do with the results. Um, Lisa Colburn and some of her colleagues, Lisa Colburn is a, a social scientist in the Northeast Fisheries Science Center for, for National Marine Fisheries Service. And she wanted to take the results of our climate change vulnerability analysis and see if she could e extrapolate it out to communities. And so what she did is she looked at communities, and this example is for Lubeck, Maine, and to see what that community currently is dependent on. So when they fish, how high is their commercial fishing reliance, and then what species are they dependent on? And you can see that they're dependent on sea urchin, lobster, to the most part, a little bit scallop, a little bit of clam. And then she can look at that and figure out, okay, how vulnerable are those species? So sea urchin, um, is on the, on the high vulnerability and lobsters on the moderate. So you can get an idea of how the vulnerability of the species could play out up at the community level. And um, there's a website for that paper. It just came out, I think, last, this month or last month. And again, I'll have that link at the end. All right, so 
getting rounding out to the end. So assessments completed are ongoing, as I mentioned and showed some of the results for. We did run an analysis on 82 species off the Northeast, um, and that is available in PLOS One. And again, if you go there, please go to the supplemental information, which has those species narratives, which is the two to three pages per each species, which is where I think is the key results. Um, we have ongoing assessments for the Eastern Bering Sea and the California current ecosystems, and other of the, the NIMS regions are showing interest, and so we expect um, one or two other areas should um, start up on this soon. Acknowledgements, I have to tell you there was a lot of people that came together to work on this project, um, creating the methodology. We ran some pilot projects. Um, I feel very fortunate we had a great team that worked on this. So I want to point out uh, Mark Nelson is the co-lead on this, and he was just great to work with. I think he might be on the call. I um, want to thank the folks from OAR, Jamie Scott and Mike Alexander, who helped create the, the portal that I pointed out. Um, we ran three pilots, um, had a nice working group membership, and then we got a lot of feedback, um, Greta Pestel in Tasmania, and then some of the nature surf folks were really helpful in telling us what they have learned from implementing their vulnerability assessments in Australia or in the terrestrial. And then here are the websites and my contact information. So there we go. I would okay. be happy to take some questions. Wendy, thank you so much. This was great. Uh, we really appreciate you presenting on this. Um, so let me, I wanted to reiterate to everyone how to ask questions. You can type the question into the question panel of the user interface, and I'll relay it. Um, and, or you can raise your virtual hand and be unmuted. We have, we, I think we have three people who have raised their hands. Just if you have, check and see if your hand is raised, and if it is raised, if it's truly, you want to be unmuted. Um, so. Uh, let's see, the, the one that was sent in, the question, could you explain more about how you use the data quality ranking in your results and why you separated uncertainty and data quality? Sure. Um, I, the second part's easier. Um, we separated them because they're slightly different. So there could be something for, let's say, you know, one of the shellfish species, you expect it's... Um, to have a high impact of ocean acidification because all the, the research to date shows all shellfish show imp, um, high impacts from ocean acidification, but there hasn't been specific research done on that species. So you could feel comfortable putting all your tallies in the high and very high for the sensitivity to OA, but yet you would have a data quality based on expert opinion because there's no um, research done on that species. So that shows you where those two things would be very different. So you can have a high confidence in your ranking, but have it be based on expert opinion. Um, so we felt it was important to separate those and pull them out. In terms of how the data quality is being used to this point, as far as I know, it's only being used to help identify those data gaps. So you can look through and figure out where we really don't know anything. Look across all the species and see that there's a huge data gap on ocean acidification. And so that can help point to where we might want to put our research dollars. Does that help? Okay, thank you, Wendy. Yes, um, and I'm going to unmute Owen. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Um, wait. Sorry. A little slow. Owen, uh, you had a question. Okay. Or what? Uh, Owen also sent in the question, so okay, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, okay. Why are elastomobranchs uh, rated highest in terms of inability to shift their range in the Atlantic states? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure because I'm not the elastomobranch expert for that reason, region. Um, it could be that they have specific larval habitats that they're needed. Um, that's one that I'll have to get with the, the experts and come back on that one off the top of my head. But it, it might be, maybe they have specific larval habitats that they, um, they can't shift away from too much. Okay, but yeah, great. That's a, a really good question and I need to look into that. Okay, um, and two of the questions, uh, well, one was asking what is going on in the Pacific on the West Coast? And there was another question, are there any results for the, from the pilot in the Southeast? We, okay, I can answer the, 
The pilot in the southeast, we did have results, but based on what we learned from that pilot, we tweaked the methodology enough that we weren't comfortable really releasing those results. And so this, that was run for the Caribbean. The southeast has shown interest, and so I'm guessing that in the near future, one of the ecosystems down there, if not more, will be running this on the updated methodology. And I, I would just feel more comfortable waiting for the, the full results because we did tweak it quite a bit after we ran that pilot. And the second question was California. Oh, well, the West Coast in general. West Coast, okay. The Pacific West Coast, yeah. So the um, California current ecosystem is being run now. The experts had their workshop two to three weeks ago. So they're going through and compiling the results and um, We'll be writing that up and getting that up sometime out sometime in the near future. So that's the status on that one. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, what was the time frame for this project? How long did this rapid assessment take? <laughs> yeah, I should put rapid in quotes. Um, <laughs> they did, so, the questioner, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that is a very valid question. Um, our plan was it for it to be more rapid than it ends up being. Um, and I think as more are implemented is going to become more rapid. So um, Alaska and the California current are moving much faster than our assessment in the Northeast. And part of that is because the Northeast was first. And second, I didn't mention, but um, Richard Merrick, the head of National Marine Fisheries Service, before he wanted to really push this to all the regions, he wanted to make sure it was legit. So um, he um, hired a cent Center for Independent Expert Review of the methodology, um, where they pulled in experts, three experts from around the world, and we had a workshop with them where we explained the methodology, and then they gave us feedback on uh, some of the tweaks to it. So that also slowed down, that, and that was done after we ran the Northeast. So that slowed down our ability to get the results out because we didn't. That they suggested a few minor tweaks that we had to go back to the experts and um, have them re-rank a couple things. The other thing that makes this not as rapid as we had originally anticipated was those write-ups for each of the species that I just think are key for if, if you are interested in managing for alewife or managing for whatever species, that's where you're going to go to. And those took a lot longer to write up. So providing two to three pages on each of the 82 species does take more of a chunk of time. Um, so it I don't know what I'm guessing maybe start to finish for the California is going to be about a year, but I, I don't know if, if Mark's on and if he can chime in because he's the one leading that. But So it's not as rapid as we were hoping, but it's still better than two years per species. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm looking for Mark to see if he's on. But. Uh, or Mark, if you, oh, Mark Nelson is on. Mark, if you have, I can either unmute you or if you wanted to send in any comments uh, via the question interface, I can relay them. Okay, let's see. Um, what platform was used for storing data and calculating rankings? Did you use an access database at all for this? Oh, I may have to have Mark answer that one as well. Um, we had, there's a, a group here at NIMPS that set us up a database where the experts could go online and fill out their rankings, and I have no idea if it was access or not. So Mark may need to be on muted, because <laughs> he was right. the one who, who did that. <laughs> Let me see if I can Sorry, get Mark, can you put, you, put you on the spot. Mark, are you there? Hello? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Yes. Uh, so, uh, first I'll answer the database question. Uh, yes, we had uh, our folks in science and technology at NOAA develop a, uh, a database for us. Uh, it is not actually access, it's uh, a web-based database, I believe the platform they used was Apex, and uh, it was pretty crucial uh, to have this uh, web-based database uh, uh, for the scoring because everyone could be on at the same time entering their scores, it was very flexible, uh, and so uh, it was flexible and it allowed for everyone to be on and uh, doing the work uh, as uh, you know when they you know whenever they they uh, had the opportunity to uh, and then at the workshop uh, it was it was really critical to have everybody online 
in uh, updating their scores as we were having this conversation. So, uh, as for the uh, West Coast um, uh, vulnerability assessment, and sort of like that, you know, the, the question of the rapid assessment, we are um, uh, the West Coast assessment. We completed our scores in. I guess we started it around, say, uh, last fall, and we're planning uh, we're planning on having uh, the paper um, prepared for submission uh, to a journal by uh, this this fall, uh, probably uh, September, or actually it's going to be November, and so it, it takes it, it it took a Good year, uh, but that was slowed down by several several things. And we could make it a little bit faster, uh, but uh, it, you know, it, it still is rapid in place. It's a lot more rapid than doing you know, quantitative, quantitatively based. Okay, All right. thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, thank you, Mark. I'll go ahead and mute you, but if you want to be unmuted, uh, just let me know. I'll, I'll raise my hand. Thanks. Right, right. That sounds perfect. Okay. Um, and then let's see. Next question. Um, can you relate your results to time? That is, when will these impacts occur? Very good question, and the answer is no. We cannot. By doing this rapid triage type assessment, we have no idea on when we expect the changes to happen or the magnitude of the changes. All it does is look across, as I said, a large number of species and suggest these may be more vulnerable than the others. So it is just a first step and it can be used for those species that are high econ economic, high important to the ecosystem. You might want to then take these results and say if they're both of those and ranked as high vulnerability, then we want to do the mechanistic analysis that does take that one to two years, and that will give you more of the when and the magnitude. But this result at, cannot at all predict magnitude or when. It's just the way it is. Okay. All right. Thank you, Andy. Um, so another question. Uh, here's some context. While individual species vulnerability is clearly important to understand for single species management, habitat vulnerability considerations may be more important to consider for for ecosystem-based management, uh, did the assessment consider or include habitats that may be most vulnerable to climate change? Right. Um, good question. And so within, there was one of the life history attributes was habitat specificity, and it was, it included some aspect of that. So how specific their habitat needs was included in that, whether they were reliant on a biological or an abiotic habitat was part of that, because obviously if you're um, reliant on corals or some other type of organism, you're going to have a higher possibility of impact from climate change if that species is impacted. And then we also looked at if, I think there was a third category, if it was um, rare or common. Um, but it did not actually include whether, I don't think if it was degraded or not. Under the um, other stressors one, I'm pretty sure we included whether it was on a habitat that was degraded. But I'm in complete agreement with whoever asked that question, and I, I hope that NIMPS in the near future um, moves forward and creates a, an analysis at the habitat scale to figure out which habitats are most vulnerable and um, what that means for management. Okay. Um, let's see. And another, we have several more good questions. Um, uh, the, always the updating one. How often do you need to conduct this vulnerability assessment? Every year, every five years, and every ten years? Right. So that's a good question. We've thought about it, and what we recommend is about every five years, um, because by then you'll know a lot more. So at this point, we don't know a lot about the impacts of ocean acidification on finfish. We do on shellfish. So in five years, we expect to have a lot more information on that. Um, the IPCC comes out with their new. Um, you know, expected climate impact models about every five years. So our hope was that it would be repeated on on a similar scale, but um, funding will and interest will determine if that's going to happen. Okay. All right. Thank you, Wendy. Um, let's see. Another many highly migratory species have spawning grounds in the Western North Pacific, albacore, bluefin. How are you analyzing their vulnerability? 
Right. Um, so if you looked, and I doubt you could, because I know the font was so small, we did not include those highly migratory species in the Northeast assessment. And the re reason why is um, I think it's somewhat suspect to do a vulnerability assessment if the species has part of the range outside of that analysis. And so our hope is in the near future to do a, um, a separate analysis for the highly migratory species that includes their full range. Um, and we do have some interest um, from the high, highly migratory folks to do that. And so we would look at those species separately and include their entire range. So it would have their spawning areas there um, where they go to feed and, and be more comprehensive. But we didn't feel including them in the Northeast assessment or any of the assessments we've done so far made sense because of that gap if we were missing part of their life history. Okay, great. Thank you, Wendy. Um, let's take some more. Uh, can functional groups such as pelagics, benthics, etc., uh, could that be more useful than individual species for some regions with poor data? That's a, a really good question. In fact, there's another study that was done in the Northeast on functional groups, and it's put out by Sarah Geishas, um, John Hare, and Jason Link. And it, we tried to start looking at that. Was it worthwhile? to run the individual species, or would it be better to just do those um, groups? And I don't know that there's a right answer. So if you're interested in running this for a region, it might be good to look at both of the papers and determine what kind of results would be, would be more informative for you. So yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a good answer for that, but that's a very good question. OK, right. Um, I, I would guess this is what the answer might be but for this one, but what is the potential to automate the process to conduct the vulnerability assessment? You mean without experts? Uh, well, they didn't specify, but I, I'm, I'm, well, with or without experts. Uh, I kind of feel that the experts are key because they add a lot of, of of the knowledge and just going to the literature and filling it out, you could get a, a good estimation, but these the folks who work on these species, you know, day in and day out really understand where their vulnerabilities are and, and where they should be ranked. Um, so my opinion is that yeah, we need to involve the experts. Okay. Um, another question. Um, what's been the reaction interest from Northeast fisheries managers and others? Has this increased interest, awareness of possible climate impacts, and how do you hope the results will be used? That's a good question. Um, Northeast, because of the changes they're experienced, have been talking about climate change for a while, and so I think these results um, just re-emphasized an interest that was already there in that region. Part of our desire to create this methodology was to start those conversations. Um, so when it's being run in the southeast, um, I think it's going to be good because it, it brings awareness to this issue for, for a lot of those areas. How we hope it's used for management, we're still talking to the managers to, to see how it's being used. It is being used in biological opinions, um, so we're, whether we're determining to, to list a species. It is being used in the NEPA analyses. But to date, I'm not sure, in terms of management, how much it can be used to really tweak management. It can start the discussion of, OK, hey, this is a species we may want to watch more. It may be one that we want to increase the monitoring on. Um, I'm hoping that may, they may decide to you know, reassess the, the buffers. There's a lot of different ways they can use it, and we're going to keep in contact with the managers um, to get a good idea of how it's being used and if there are, are tweaks we can do to the next run of the methodology to make it even more useful for the managers. Um, there are two questions about where to find documents. One uh, person was looking for the CIE review, uh, and another was look at, uh, uh, wanted to know where the two to three page species narratives were located. Okay. The, if you go to up here under the Northeast results, the PLOS One um, has the results. It's on the, the two to three pages is supplemental information under the PLOS One. I believe you can also get to it from the, the NIMS website, which is listed below it. So you should be able to get it from both of those spots in terms of the supplemental information. The CIE review is not online. Um, I don't know if we can. I, I'm not an expert on, on running CI, 
Center of Independent Expert Reviews, and if those can be provided online, um, but at this point I'm sure it is not. So don't search too hard for that, you're not going to find it. Okay, all right, that's good to know. Um, <laughs> and there's one other, there's some, well, there, we'll, we'll have, cover one more question, and then for anyone else who had questions we weren't able to get to or questions you weren't able to ask, uh, please go ahead and contact Wendy, her email's right there. Yep. Um, so last question. Um, so great work, but I didn't see any terms for changes in interactions between species aside from food as ranges change. Right. Um, and I think that's a very good point, and we've gotten that question a lot as like the secondary effects. So we're just a lot of other than food, mostly this is um, primary impacts, and they're right. Um, this expert-based methodology is, does not get into some of those secondary effects. It might in terms of some of those species narratives if it's one that they know. So um, you know the prey species is high, highly vulnerable. But at this point, um, with this triage methodology, we're not really getting into some of those expected changes in, in interactions. Okay. Okay, Wendy, this was fabulous. Thank you. Um, I learned a ton, and uh, there was obviously tremendous interest. So um, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate you presenting on this work, and we oh, hope yeah. to have you back some other time. Uh, sure, and thank you, it. everyone who was able to participate. Uh, we'll see you again in a future webinar. Okay. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks.